Okay, thank you. Well, it's delightful to be here and be back at Princetonite since I graduated. Uh, thank you. I haven't uh, haven't been back here very often, um, but uh, it's uh, nice to see the campus again. When I was here as an undergraduate, what what uh, David didn't mention is I kind of switched fields between being a graduate student and a professor. I got all of my degrees in physics. I was here in physics at Palmer Lab. I worked, interesting, I was reminded this morning with Bob Dickey um, on measuring gravity. And here I am talking about the moon's gravity field uh, as a result of a spacecraft experiment that we did. Uh, so that, that has sort of been consistent. But uh, I did my PhD at Caltech in uh, particle physics. My PhD was on quark theory. Uh, but then two years later, I went back to Caltech as a professor of geology. Um, as, as a result, uh, it's, it's a longer story, but um, as a result of uh, getting out of Pasadena in the summertime uh, to get away from the smog and uh, working and doing glaciology in the summers because the physicists would never allow a, us graduate students to go with them to Aspen where they went in the summertime. <laughs> <coughs> so anyway, um, <coughs> what I uh, start my talk out with, this is um, the moon as you've probably never seen it before. Uh, the uh, colors are the gravitational acceleration of the surface of the moon in uh, milligal, and a gal is a unit of gravity named Galileo, and it's an acceleration of one centimeter per second squared. So, uh, and uh, if you're familiar with the gravity measurements of the Earth, uh, 600 milligals is a big, big variation in the gravitational field. And you can see that the moon has got spots of uh, very large acceleration of gravity, as well as areas where the gravitational acceleration is low. And many of them are circular, hint, hint. Uh, so anyway, uh, I'm going to start the regular colloquium. As a result of um, the interest in gravity of the moon um, that's uh, accumulated over time, uh, we did a mission, um, NASA mission, to measure the moon's gravitational field with um, a higher precision than has ever been done before. And I'm going to talk today a bit about the mission itself, about what we found, and uh, the implications of what we found. Uh, I have to say that the story isn't over as a result of the data set that we collected. Um, there are papers coming out. In fact, this year, probably more papers are coming out than have been published in any previous year using this wonderful data set. But uh, uh, those of you who know me, there are a couple in the audience know I also am interested in history of ideas. Where do ideas come from and so on? And so we could start out with the moon. It's, it's, moon is a subject that is difficult to, to say where the first publication was because we've been, you know, as a, a, a race, um, <coughs> looking at the moon, um, you know, before we were even human. Uh, and so it's hard to find the first publication. But there is an indication, this may be the first publication on it. Um, this, uh, the, the <coughs> black marks here are a, uh, <coughs> a marking on a, a stone in Ireland uh, 5,000 years before present. Uh, what the author had to say, we don't understand uh, very well. But this uh, correlation suggests that it had something to do with the lunar mare. But, um, what, what they were thinking was somewhat lost to time. Uh, the modern understanding of the moon started with Galileo in 1610, who um, uh, on the, the basis of reports of what could happen if you put two lenses together, uh, invented his own telescope. Apparently, he did the uh, ray tracing analysis himself and figured out how to put the telescope together. And he made these uh, sketches of the moon in his famous um, letter to the scientific community of Europe about variations in the lunar surface, as well as discovery of the moons of Jupiter and so on and so forth. Uh, this publication got him into immediate trouble with the, uh, the reigning uh, authorities, the church, because the moon was supposed to be perfect, perfectly smooth. It didn't have variations in topography. And he saw shadows. In fact, he made shadow measurements and had some idea of the elevation changes. Um, one thing he saw that was characteristic of the moon was what he called circular spots. He didn't name them. Uh, that The name crater came much later. Uh, but um, he uh, had seen these and recognized that they were uh, the uh, 
the, the dominant landform on the moon, wisely he did not speculate on their origin. Um, there were contemporaries of his like Robert Hooke who did. Uh, Hooke was an inveterate speculator and um, Hooke actually thought that maybe impact might have made these things, but he dismissed the whole idea because he decided there was nothing out there to fall on the moon and therefore it couldn't uh, be of impact. He decided that they were, um, he had an analogy of, of boiling alabaster, bubbles coming to the surface and bursting, and decided they were volcanic. But anyway, the next uh, big step up in understanding the moon came with the Apollo missions. I'm leaving out, of course, a lot in between. <laughs> um, and uh, at any rate, the um, Apollo astronauts went to the moon, uh, basically as a political statement. But they did fortunately collect some rocks in, uh, during uh, their other excursions on the moon. Um, and some of the later astronauts were convinced by geological trainers that there was something really rather interesting that they could do. Now, the Apollo missions were not the first mission. You don't send humans to the moon uh, without some reconnaissance. And uh, there were a number of precursor missions, including this one. This is the, a lunar orbiter spacecraft. Uh, there were a number of these that were sent to go around the moon and to <coughs> photograph the surface and uh, learn what they could about the moon before astronauts actually um, went there. Uh, what you're looking at is the solar panels, the communications, and a uh, thruster, and you can't even see the, the camera system that's kind of buried in there. Um, very mechanical camera system. Now, one of the first order discoveries about the, the moon, uh, not made by orbiter, but by uh, Russian satellites before this, <coughs> was the astonishing fact that the far side of the moon looks different than the near side. We should have expected, <coughs> in fact, everybody did, that the far side would be a different version of the near side. In fact, it's quite different. And that's the first order big surprise. If you also measure topography, the highest elevations on the moon are about here, <coughs> about uh, over a, a sphere. They're about um, eight kilometers higher than the average sphere fitting the moon's topography. The lowest elevations of the moon are right, right here, not too far away at minus 11 uh, kilometers below the surface in a big circular structure, which is an impact structure, uh, the South Pole Aiken Basin. Uh, yes. Yeah, well, um, rotating planets are oblate, something even Newton recognized. Uh, but the moon doesn't rotate very fast. And um, in fact, its, its shape is maintained by its strength. Uh, which on the moon is easier to do than comparable on, on the Earth. It's also less hot inside, so it hasn't relaxed to a near spherical shape. And um, that's, that's another important fact about the moon. Um, and uh, <coughs> well, I, I could go very much farther into that. But let me wait until afterwards if you're interested. Um, one of the other things the orbiters did uh, is that um, you could range between the spacecraft and the ground. That's the way spacecraft are navigated mostly, by the way. We don't know the angles to the spacecraft, but we do know the distance to the, uh, from the, the, the uh, receiving antennas on Earth to the spacecraft very accurately. Put that together with Newton's law of motions, or in, in this case with, with uh, Einstein's law. We did measure Einstein gravity, uh, <coughs> deviations from Newtonian gravity. But you can use the uh, equations of motion of gravity. And if you know just the distance, you know where the spacecraft is. Um, and uh, that is what was done. Measure the uh, Doppler distance. And you can measure the, um, the accelerations of the spacecraft as it travels around the uh, moon. Now, the spacecraft is in the, an elliptical orbit, Keplerian orbit, pretty much uh, around the moon. And so uh, Knowing that it's a Keplerian orbit, you can predict what the accelerations uh, relative to the ground ought to be. And, um, and that, that's all fine. But then you can ask, well, what are the actual accelerations of gravity? Turns out they're not exactly the same as uh, you expect from a Keplerian orbit. There are deviations. Those deviations were um, originally noted and plotted up. I don't expect you to be able to see these charts. This was actually a six by six map that sat on a big table at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in which the, uh, the residual accelerations were plotted by hand. 
Um, and uh, this is the original paper of Muller and Shogren. Muller was an undergraduate at Caltech at the time, by the way. Shogren is uh, now retired, but uh, was a big player in, in gravity at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. They measured these accelerations, and what they found was, uh, to their horror, uh, huge accelerations, devi deviations from a spherical moon. They were called mass concentrations, mass cons, um, and uh, they were initially regarded with horror as a navigational hazard. If there are reefs of space, these are they. Uh, that uh, these big accelerations of gravity alter the orbit of a satellite to the point that you could crash a satellite, uh, which would happen in no short order. Um, in fact, as a result of this, uh, the Apollo missions were planned, the vehicles had been designed, the capacity of fuel tanks had been designed, um, and then this was discovered. Well, they had to raise the expected orbital um, distance of the Apollo spacecraft to avoid being crashed by these darn mascons. And uh, as a result, some of you may remember that uh, Neil Armstrong, well, in fact, it's in the movie too, Neil Armstrong almost ran out of fuel in landing um, on the you know, Apollo 11 mission. Part of the reason he ran out of fuel is that the, um, the orbital altitude was actually designed to be about half of what they had to use. Uh, and it was the mascons, the fear of the mascons, that uh, caused them to raise the, um, the uh, orbital um, altitude. Huh? Okay, yes, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> So the Earth has uh, gravitational accelerations as well. These are from the, uh, the GRACE satellites, uh, which are uh, rather like our, our satellites, a pair of satellites in great, what's called gradiometer configuration, measuring the gravity field. This is the, the Earth greatly exaggerated. This is the Earth's gravity field in milligals. And you can see the scale goes from minus 50 to plus 50. Uh, with the Moon's scale I, uh, that I showed in initially, I had minus 600 to plus 600. So the moon, the Earth's gravitational field is considerably um, less rough than the moon's gravitational field. There are a few anomalies that are as big as the moon uh, associated with the su subduction zones. But by and large, the, moon's, uh, or the Earth's gravitational anomalies are quite small compared to the Earth's. Well, it's, it's uh, with the larger gravitational field of the Earth and the uh, higher temperatures in the Earth's interior allow stresses to relax in a way that does not occur on the Moon. Now, gravity is something that we're really interested in because gravity allows you to see through anything. Nothing blocks gravity. You can't screen it. And as a result, um, you want to measure the gravity field of the Moon if you would like to probe into the interior of the Moon. We see the surface of the Moon now in great detail from many, many um, uh, spacecraft observations. The Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter is the most recent one. But if you want to probe beneath the moon's surface and see what's inside, use gravity. And um, we can. this is a, a gravity map of, of the Earth, uh, of the United States. And the reason I show it is that uh, geologic prospectors have been using gravity for years. For example, dense ore deposits have a uh, positive gravity signature. You can, you know, the Canadians uh, fly over the surface of Canada and look for such gravity anomalies to look for ore deposits. Uh, similarly, in the Gulf Coast area, oil is associated with uh, low density anomalies with, um, with uh, uh, salt domes, and you can find those by, by means of gravity. I show this because uh, particularly, you can see here through the middle of the United States, there's a big positive gravity anomaly called the Mid-Continent High, and um, it's very prominent on the gravity map. If you go on the ground and look on the ground, you see absolutely nothing. Um, you know, the geologist mapped over here, nothing particularly special going on on the surface. What we're looking at is that the North America started to get rift apart about a billion and a half years ago. Um, the rift filled up with lavas, and then it stopped rifting for you know, another reorganization of plates. But it left you know, dense lavas sitting in this uh, kind of proto-rift. Uh, and it's easy to see with gravity, but we can't see it uh, very easily any other way. Now, to measure the moon's gravity, rather than 
measuring vertical gravity uh, with a gravimeter, which basically is a weight on a spring. Um, you know, it's more elaborate than that, but terrestrial gravimeters work that way. Instead, um, we uh, decided to use two satellites in the same orbit, uh, exchanging information between each other in order to measure the distance between the two satellites with very, very high precision. It's called a gravity gradiometer approach. The GRACE satellites used it uh, before we did. In fact, these are modified GRACE satellites. Uh, the GRACE satellites were a tremendous success in measuring small variations in the Earth's gravity. Um, but they had to fly at 550 kilometers because the Earth has an atmosphere. Uh, the advantage we have is the moon doesn't have an atmosphere, we can get much lower. So GRACE doesn't have very much horizontal resolution. It does have a lot of precision. If it rains in the Amazon across the basin, GRACE will detect that. If the Greenland ice sheet loses a millimeter of ice, it's detectable with GRACE, but with 500 kilometers horizontal resolution. Uh, we use the same configuration as gravity gradiometer configuration. We navigate the satellites to Earth. Uh, GRACE was navigated by the GPS system, of uh, which there is not at least yet one around the moon. Uh, so we had to use a, a different kind of navigation. But the two satellites uh, have ultra-stable oscillators, so they can tell time very well. Uh, they exchange uh, uh, signals, and we measure the distance between these two satellites with a precision of one-tenth of a micron. Now, a human hair is 100 microns in diameter. So this is measuring the distance between these satellites. Typically, we flew about 50 kilometers apart, measuring it with a precision of you know, one thousandth of a width of a human hair. You can imagine we had to go to a lot of trouble and a lot of care to be able to do this. If you fire a thruster, you change the center of mass. Not much but enough that we, we really saw that. So that we had to be very careful about not firing thrusters for as long as possible and, um, and working with high precision. Now, I probably don't need to tell most people here how this works, but uh, I'll do it anyway. Uh, if, we, if you imagine we have a mass anomaly here, some uh, excess or deficit of gravity, with the two satellites in orbit, one, one following the other, uh, the satellite here may have been accelerated as it moved up toward the mass. It's not accelerating now, but the trailing satellite is being accelerated. And by measuring the distance between the two, or the velocity between the two by the Doppler effect, uh, we can see the effect of this mass. And then as this satellite moves on and this one catches up, then we have a retardation and we see it compressing again. So in order to measure the full gravity field, we use um, this equation, the um, Laplace's equation, that the divergence of gravity is zero in free space. We measure the acceleration of gravity in the horizontal direction, x direction right here. We measure this directly along track. Um, we measure the uh, horizontal variation in the other direction, the cross track, by making many, many tracks that are parallel to one another. And from that, we can deduce the vertical gravity field. <clears throat> now, this isn't actually the way we, we analyze that we do a spherical harmonic expansion. But in essence, that, that's what's going on. We're, we're using this equation, the divergence-free st structure of the gravitational field. We're measuring one component of it, but, um, and then this one from many parallel tracks from which we can deduce the entire gravity field. So in, that's in essence what we're doing. Uh, we can, for example, measure uh, this is if there's a deficit. Um, we can measure uh, the accelerations across uh, uh, distance. In this case, this was a, a, an empty lava tube. Uh, there are caves underneath the surface of the moon, by the way. I, I'll talk about that a little bit later. We detected them by looking for signals like this um, in the um, acceleration. And <coughs> I should say, you notice that this is the horizontal acceleration in milligals. This is about a one milligal. Our precision was um, well, it was narrower than this line here. Um, it turns out it wasn't the precision that was really controlling us. There's a lot of other stuff going on, and separating all the different things going on was the hard part. Uh, <coughs> here's what the spacecraft looked like. They're about the size of a dishwasher. Um, there are two of them. Uh, 
A and B, or they were named Ebb and Flow by some high school students in Montana. Uh, we had a competition. We have an outreach program. Uh, and uh, this they're put together in, in Lockheed. Uh, these horns are the, um, the horns that uh, send the signals between the two spacecraft. They're essentially identical spacecraft. Uh, we had an operations concern. Uh, it was, turned out not to be a problem, but we worried about operations that Grail A might get uh, instructions sent up for it for Grail B and vice versa. And so at Jet Propulsion Laboratory, we put the, uh, the two control centers for Grail A and B in separate buildings. We made sure that they had each their own Coke machines. Um, and we encouraged the two t uh, operations teams not to talk to one another um, so that they never mixed up the instructions. It worked, it worked fine. We, we never had that problem, but it took uh, some effort. Uh, for those of people who like electronics, this, this is uh, uh, kind of the electronics boxes and a block diagram. I'm not going to, I was not responsible for this. I'm, I'm not going to uh, belabor it. If people are interested, we can go, go up with that later. But another thing that I, I have to mention uh, always is that um, the spacecraft operations are never the result of one or two people. This is not, not like uh, traditional you know, Institute for Advanced Study Sciences of one, one very smart guy sitting, you know, draw, drawing equations on a piece of paper. This is the subset of our team at Lockheed that built the spacecraft. Here is our, um, uh, our principal investigator, Maria Zuber. Uh, at MIT and our, um, our chief scientist, and then a whole bunch of other people that built the spacecraft. And then that doesn't count all the people that built the launch vehicle, the operations people, the science team. There were about 13 of us, uh, and um, all the other people. All in all, probably 10,000 people made essential contributions to the success of this mission. So um, this is something that, that the spacecraft missions are all collaborative affairs of many, many people. And uh, we invested, uh, you know, NASA doesn't allow you to say spent, uh, we invested about $240 million of all of our monies in this mission in order to learn more about gravity. Of course, my students at Purdue were involved in this. Um, these are graduate students who now, um, many of them have uh, faculty positions. We had our launch. We launched on a, a Delta II rocket, always a nail-biting um, uh, time to make sure that it gets off there. I, walking around the, the night before, you know, a tower 140 feet high, full of explosive. Um, and, uh, you know, you look at that and you say, that's never going to get off the ground. <laughs> you know, it, huge, massive thing. But it, 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 in the end, uh, after some weather holds took off, uh, we took a long looping trajectory to the moon, launched from Earth. <coughs> we flew out to uh, Lagrange Point 1, thereabouts in that vicinity. Uh, we separated shortly uh, after we launched from Earth. Uh, the two spacecraft then looped back to the moon. That was in order to, to save fuel, but also um, plane changes are very expensive. If we had gone directly to the moon, we'd be in orbit around the moon's equator, and that's not what we wanted. We wanted full coverage of the moon. We wanted a polar orbit, and rather than trying to change the plane of the orbit, which is very expensive in terms of fuel, we looped out here and came in from the top uh, and entered a polar orbit of the two spacecraft. <coughs> and I'll, I'll show you shortly some uh, other images of what we saw at the moon. Once at the moon, we commenced mapping. Uh, the entire mapping program, a, a mapping unit, um, is three months long. In one month, the moon turns underneath us. We're basically in inertial space. And you know the orbit is fixed in inertial space, pretty much, uh, and the moon turns underneath us. So in one month, we cover the entire moon. Well, that gives gives us enough coverage at the poles, but the tr tracks at the equator uh, were uh, too far apart. They were about 15 kilometers apart. So we go another month, we fill in part of those tracks, and then a third month, we fill in the the uh, other tracks. So we have about uh, five to 10 kilometer spacing at the equator. Uh, so we have all those parallel tracks. Uh, <coughs> with, when the mission ended, and we did that, by the way, uh, two times. We originally entered an orbit at 55 kilometers height. Um, we mapped out the moon's gravity field. Uh, we 
we're at that height because um, we weren't sure what the gravity field was. As we learned what the gravity field was, we lowered the orbit to uh, a, an average of about 20 kilometers. And then we did an end game where we were about 10 kilometers over the surface of the moon. The closer you get to the surface of the moon, the more sensitive you are to the gravity field and uh, short wavelength variations in gravity. And so we kept going lower and lower as the mission proceeded. We can now reliably fly even 10 kilometers over the surface of the moon since we know the gravity field with such high precision. We ended our mission um, after about a year. Uh, <coughs> and we, um, we didn't crash the spacecraft. We deorbited it. <laughs> but, you, know, you, you have to get a lesson in NASA, NASA terminology to give these lectures. So we deorbited the spacecraft by crashing it into a ridge. Sally Ride here was our, um, our, our outreach person. You know, every NASA mission, you have to spend 1% of your mission funding on outreach. And we did that. Um, and I'll, I'll explain in a minute what we did. Uh, she, she coordinated this. But she died of cancer uh, during the mission. And so we ended up picking out a ridge on the near side of the moon that had not been named. And it is now officially named Sally Ride Ridge. Uh, and these are the, this is the before and after image of the, uh, of the spacecraft. I mean, they didn't make big craters. They were about five meters across. But we, we did do before and after imaging. Now, I'm going to show a couple of um, engineering maps. Um, and I, I hope everybody is OK with this. We, saw, we looked at an awful lot of these during the mission. This is a, a map of the moon. This is longitude. Zero degrees longitude is facing the Earth. This is latitude, minus 90 south pole, plus 90 north pole. And what the colors indicate are the altitude of the spacecraft and um, altitude above the actual surface. This is something we had to be real careful of. Um, the, the navigators like to tell us about altitude above the average spherical moon. That's fine. But if the moon has mountains 11 kilometers high and you're down at 10, you want to know what the elevation above the actual surface of the moon is. So this is actual elevation. Um, and of course, you need a good topography to do this. But you'll, you'll see that uh, we were down above 6 kilometers uh, in a lot of places in the moon in our, this is the second component of the mission, our extended mission, when we lowered the altitude. Uh, here is the same kind of data in a different way. This is time to the end of our mission right here, 17th of December. And this is altitude. And there are two traces. This is, this is Grail A, this is Grail B. Uh, the two traces are, one is with respect to the uh, the navigator's moon, the perfectly spherical moon, and the other with respect you know, dark yellow with the actual topography. And you can see that we were you know, averaging about 15 kilometers uh, as we went in, and then eventually we came down to essentially zero. That was the end, end of our mission. We'd run out of fuel, and we couldn't have continued it anyway. Now, I'm going to show you a movie, and let me get this going. There are a lot of credits to begin with, so I can continue talking. Uh, <clears throat> this is a movie that was made by a couple of lipstick cameras that were stuck on the spacecraft at the end. This is our outreach. We, we, these are off-the-shelf lipstick TV cameras that we put onto the spacecraft. They were steered by high school students. We had a, a, um, a, a, a camera control center that went around um, to different high schools. What you're looking at, this is near the end of our mission. We just uh, went down from the North Pole. This is you're riding the spacecraft. We're about 15 kilometers altitude. This is sped up some. It, it took about 40 minutes to get from pole to pole. But this is, if you were on the spacecraft, what you would see. You might have a cup of coffee looking out the window as this unreeled as you um, went down. This is a forward-looking camera. And uh, shortly, it will switch to the rear view camera. Uh, and you can see where we have been, sort of like riding a train facing backwards. Um, <coughs> but uh, this is what the moon looks like from pretty uh, close to the surface, if you were uh, actually riding on the spacecraft. Well, the, the <laughs> they, they actually could choose exposures, and we could control by the attitude where they pointed. And 
when, when we allowed the students to mess with the at spacecraft attitude, which we didn't while we were collecting data, <coughs> they could do this. Uh, uh, you know, time is limited, and I don't want to go into a lot of detail, but the students did a great job. Uh, they had the idea of uh, filming the separation of the two spacecraft in space, which had never been done before, and we were able to do that and uh, have footage of that, as well as many images of the surface of the moon. There were something like 100 um, high schools that we stopped at and allowed the students in the science program to um, pick where, where they would take images, when they would take images of the, the surface of the moon. And I think that was pretty successful. I, was anybody here part of that? OK, I, I haven't. I, I occasionally run into somebody who, who did uh, play a role in that. OK, the next uh, images I'm going to show um, are put together to demonstrate this, is, this globe on the left is topography of the moon. Blue is low and red is high. Uh, <coughs> on the right-hand side, we see at the organized the same longitude. This is the gravity field of the moon that we measured. This is, um, you know, well inferred from the uh, the spacecraft tracks, uh, and you can see the high acceleration, low acceleration. <coughs> what happens at this line, though, is you may be able to see that most of the craters, most of the topography is reflected in the gravity. In fact, it's distressing. Uh, the moon is kind of boring in terms of gravity uh, because most of, the, uh, most of the gravity field is correlated with topography, much more so than on the Earth. So what we've done on the right-hand side is this is um, the gravity field with the topography removed. Something for those geologically oriented people this is Bouguer gravity. That is, we've taken off the, the topographic contribution to the gravity field. And you can see it's a lot smoother uh, and more boring. But you can see these red circles. These are the craters. These are the mass cons. Uh, and uh, these are the near side, the big mass cons, Imbrium, Serenitatis. Uh, <coughs> but uh, this is Oriental crater. And you can see that on the far side, mass cons, uh, there's positive surrounded by negative uh, for the gravity field. One of our questions. Yes. So there's something denser underneath that's not accounted for by the topography. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. This is, this is above and beyond what we expect from the topographic variations. And the fact that you see big signals indicates that there's something much denser underneath these big craters. Now, Imbrium is filled with lava. And you th can say, well, lava is denser than the average lunar crust. <coughs> Maybe it's that. It turns out that's not enough. Uh, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, it, it basically, what has happened is that these big impacts punch through the crust of the moon. And the dense, um, dense mantle material has risen up in a plug underneath the crater. So here again is the free air gravity um, in a mile-wide projection, uh, same data as before. But again, you can see, you see the moon is covered with craters. <coughs> on the near side, where the mare are, it's a lot smoother. But on the far side, where there are no mare, crater after crater after crater. So this is the topo well, this is topography from the um, lunar orbiter uh, la laser altimeter. <coughs> we have a very good topographic uh, map of the moon. This low area is the South Pole Aiken Basin. These are the near side Mari. This is centered on the uh, eastern limb of the moon. And um, you can see lots and lots of craters. Well, you can correlate the two. You know, here's, here's a visual correlation. This is topography of the far side. This is gravity. You know, you know see a crater, see the crater. Govian, yes, Govians. Um, they're a little bit different in structure, but you can see a lot of the craters are reflected in the gravity field. You, <coughs> you can go into spectral space, and this is in uh, spherical harmonic expansion. This is the harmonic degree versus the coherence between gravity and topography. And <coughs> the blue line is the moon. You can see gravity and topography are like 96% correlated. 
after the low order uh, degrees, uh, they're you know out to degree in order 540 or so. Um, you can see gravity and topography are virtually the same, uh, except for the, the low waters, that is, long wavelength. If you look at the other planets, here's Earth, the green line, uh, Venus, the uh, yellow line. Uh, we also have Mars on, on here, hard to see. But there's no such correlation uh, between gravity and topography for any of the terrestrial planets. So the moon is unique in that respect. You can say the moon is boring in that respect. It doesn't have very much gravity that is not explained by topography. It makes that part that is explained by topography, or is not explained, uh, pretty interesting. <coughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. It, it's still around 600 milligals. The, the bulk of the, the big uh, anomalies are associated with the basins because of this big mantle output after the impact. And I, I can show you a little, I can show some simulations of how that happened shortly. Uh, oh, sure. Yeah, the mass cons are, are down here in terms of wavelength. So yeah, the, the, the mass con stuff is, is all down in here in the, uh, the low order harmonics. <coughs> One of the first things we were able to do is we can look at the correlation of topography and gravity. As, you know, there are wavelengths of different uh, topography. We correlate that with a gravity, uh, different wavelengths. And so by looking at the correlation, we can invert for a density. And what we find is that the density of the lunar crust is considerably lower than the uh, compressed density of the material that we may believe make up the crust. <coughs> so the moon is porous. The moon's crust, the entire crust, down to the mantle and maybe deeper, is porous. And so the, the, these are maps not in the Mari regions because we have problems there with the, um, the, uh, the lava cover. <coughs> but outside of it, you can see that the, the mean porosity of the lunar crust is about 12%. That's higher than the Earth. And it also uh, goes to very great depths. Um, I'm not showing it here, but uh, we can also do the, for the depth, look at the depth dependence of the uh, porosity. Of course, it's much more porous in the upper parts than the lower parts. But still, the average crustal porosity is 12%, considerably higher than we have on Earth. Uh, that may be partly due to the lower gravity, that is the moon tends not to compress uh, porosity out as much, but I think it also has to do with the history of the moon. The moon crust has been beaten up by impacts, impact after impact after impact, and those impacts have smashed the crust and opened uh, porosity throughout the entire 30 kilometer depth of the crust. Yes. Exactly. Yeah, we, we've got samples of the highlands which are north of site, and we can estimate what the, uh, the non-porous density of that is. <coughs> we also have uh, other ways of estimating the, the de density of the crust. And, um, so we have an average crustal density. This was actually new, and in fact, it was thought uh, before the GRAIL mission that, um, for example, that the amount of aluminum in the Earth's in the moon's crust was higher than in the earth. Um, what we uh, recognize, because the crust is, is uh, thinner and more porous, that in fact the aluminum content, aluminum oxide content, in the average moon is similar to the average earth. Uh, and it, you know, so the moon is not anomalous in that. It is anomalous in terms of iron abundance, but um, so not aluminum. Hmm? Well, we, we also have that. The, the average crustal thickness is about 30 kilometers that we deduce. Yeah. Yeah, it was thought before our mission that the crust was, uh, average crust was thicker, you know, about 45 kilometers. And we do not confirm that. We get about, about 30 kilometers for the average crustal thickness. So here is the uh, gravity with topography taken away. 
<coughs> so you can, and, and actually I, I cheated a little bit in order to see where you are. Um, this, this was created <coughs> with uh, a little bit of topography showing through. You, you can do that with these modern graphics. Uh, so these little craters that you see are actually <coughs> part of a, a, a transparency mask. So you can see where they are. But you can see basically you know, every, every place that a big impact has punctured the crust of the moon, we see a red circle usually surrounded by a blue low, low density circle. Uh, <coughs> this is the mantle uplift. This is the th extra thickened crust that was blasted out of the crater and piled up um, next to the, the, uh, the big basin itself. Now, most of these correlate with known craters, not all of them. And that, that's kind of interesting. <coughs> there are a couple of these basins, for example, this one here. We had no clue before Grail that there was an impact structure there. Obviously very ancient, it's been beaten up by other things, but there are not many of these. It, it was thought before Grail that um, the, the big impact basins we see were only 10% of the total big impacts that occurred on the moon. We now know better. <coughs> it's the other way around. We, we can observe 90% of the, all the impacts that have punctured the crust of the moon. Uh, there are only a few that uh, we are uh, did not know before the, um, the GRAIL mission. So we basically have a record of every big impact that punctured the moon's crust since the crust existed. Hmm? Yeah. The, yeah, this is again the, the eastern limb of the moon. These are the mare over here. <coughs> you can see it's, it's kind of modeled a little bit uh, because the, uh, the dense lavas tend to uh, obscure that a little bit. But you can see for example, underneath Copernicus crater right here, uh, there's a, a, a big mantle uplift that we had no idea was before, um, before the GRAIL mission. Uh, and there are a couple others like this. Uh, <coughs> but an, another thing that we see, I mean, it's, <coughs> okay, is, is everything just impact on the moon? Um, I, I study impacts, I, that would be great, but there, there is a little bit more. <coughs> you may be able to see around the, the mare that there is a figure kind of surrounding it. If you connect up the dots, some people see a pentagram. Uh, <coughs> well, the, the, the witches have been working in the middle maybe. Uh, <coughs> if you project it another way, you can kind of straighten this out and actually see a square. But <coughs> in any event, there are gravity highs surrounding the mare. These are all the mare area, and these, are, these form at the edges of the mare. We think that what we're looking at, th this is the plumbing underneath the, uh, the big lava flows on the moon. These are, are probably uh, parallel dikes, vertical uh, fissures filled with dense lava, and these were where all the feeders for the big lava flows on the moon came up through the, the moon's crust. And there's, there's a bit more of a story on that <coughs> that, um, well, I, I actually let me show you that. I can sharpen this up by doing a, a horizontal derivative of the gravity field, and you can see here, this, this is the gradient of gravity. You can see either a pentagram or a square, uh, depending upon <coughs> how you look at it. This is the same gravi gravity field, but projected, well, it, it's a, a, a stretch it a little bit different, so, so as to bring out this, uh, this feeder structure. Uh, you can see a couple of other parallel streaks, dikes here and here. Um, but basically, we're looking, we think, at the gravitational feeder system. What we do not see is a big impact crater. It had been thought that this area was a gigantic impact crater called the Procolarum crater. Uh, we, don't, we do not see that. We see big impact structures over here. Here's the South Pole Lincoln Basin. You can see it here. But um, <coughs> it, the near side apparently isn't a big impact. Um, it's, uh, it's an area that's low topographically. And uh, for reasons that we still don't understand, this is where the lavas came up. Uh, <coughs> just to uh, emphasize here, the uh, hidden craters. This is a, um, an area in the moon that uh, we had not suspected that there was an impact structure. But here's the same area in gravity. Obviously, there's a, a big 
gravity high here that uh, reflects an ancient basin. You can't see any evidence of the ancient basin in the topography at the present time. Uh, so here we have an example of uh, <coughs> one of the few uh, basins that were not recognized at the present time. We think now we understand the origin of the mascons. Um, I, I could give a whole hour lecture on this, and I'll, I'll try not to do that. Hopefully, I can get to the questions. Uh, <coughs> but the idea is that an impact occurred. We had an impact basin, and the <coughs> mantle of denser rocks below the moon's crust rebounded, um, and in fact, rebounded so vigorously that it went up beyond the isostatic uh, equilibrium and settled back down to higher than isostatic equilibrium, after which the, you know, there was a hot pocket underneath. Uh, that <coughs> drove uh, flow afterwards because of the, the lower topography and pushed more material up there to give some last up uplift. Uh, we can fit that model in detail. <coughs> Here's a Freundless Sharonov, which is a basin on the far side. This is the gravity field. Um, if we calculate, uh, and I'll show you some of those calculations in a moment, what the gravity field shortly after the impact would be, it's this white line. If we then allow the mantle of the moon to flow inward, uh, as we expect uh, it would do over a long time because of the high temperature, you know, at, at high temperatures, solid materials flow slowly. This is the post uplift, the red line, and these are the, um, the observations. We can, can uh, we think, fit the gravity field of the mass con quite well. Now with Humorum Basin, which is a near side basin, we do the same thing. This is a pre right after the impact. Um, the red line is after flow has occurred, and we don't match the gravity. But we know that Humorum is full of lava. Freundly Sharonov is not. So then we put in the lava with the estimated thickness that we think it should have, and we get the blue line. So we can see that the lava filling has given us another 100 milligals of gravity on. This is, this is uh, lava about three kilometers thick, supported out of equilibrium. It did not sink down to isostatic equilibrium. It's supported by strength of the moon. The moon at that time of the the lava flows, which took place about a billion years after the uh, impact basin formed, the moon by that time was strong enough it could support that. Yes? Um, the impact angle doesn't matter, um, which is th th that's a, another uh, story. Astronomers once dismissed uh, impact as the origin of craters because there are not very many elliptical ones. What we understand now is that at very high speed, the projectile comes in and basically deposits all of its energy in, in essentially a point region. And the crater then it greatly expands beyond that. Typical craters are 20 times larger in diameter than the projectile. So the projectile composition, size, angle doesn't matter. All that matters is we dumped a lot of energy in a small region near the moon and it blew out a big hole. So yeah, the until you get down to about five degrees uh, approach angle, it really doesn't matter. And we do have a couple craters on the moon that, that are strongly elongate. <coughs> Schiller is an example, and uh, those are probably the rare low, low angle impacts. Uh, <coughs> one of the things we did in our end game, we didn't have enough uh, fuel to go for another, another full mapping cycle, so we decided what we would do, um, bring the orbit down as low as we could safely do, which meant we were flying 500 meters over some of the topo topographic highs. <coughs> we made many, many tracks over this uh, impact basin, the Oriental Basin, on the lunar far side. You can barely see it on the, the eastern limb of the moon, <coughs> but um, the, um, we, we made many, many tracks over this. We brought the orbit down to really, really low altitude. And this is the topography of the Oriental Basin. It's one of the freshest, uh, most recent big basins on the moon. It's about 900 kilometers from here to here. It's about the, the length of California from end to end. <coughs> big structure. Here. Hmm? 
Oh, that is a good question. Um, it is stated um, with two decimal places to be 3.16 billion years old, but I don't believe that, not to do decimal places. Um, it's, it's based on assumptions about what the cratering rate is and, um, and correlating that in only a couple places we have with, with rocks brought back. Uh, but it, it is the youngest, and most of the big basins formed at uh, uh, about uh, 4.2 to maybe 3.5 billion years ago as a round number. I'd, I'd say, you know, around 3 plus billion years. <coughs> but with higher precision, we, we really can't be sure. Um, so here's the free air gravity, and this is with the topography taken out. You can see the mantle uplift. You can see this is the material that was blown out of the basin, um, and basically extra thickened crust. Um, and then uh, in many of these basins, you see a little positive anomaly outside here. That's the load of the ejecta from the crater on the uh, pre-existing crust. So uh, here's a, a modeling that we can do. <coughs> this is vertically exaggerated. Geologists like to do this. Uh, <coughs> You can see the mantle uplift of, you know, mantle, typical mantle densities of about 3,200 kilograms per cubic meter. The crust is about 2,550. That is fractured crust. <coughs> We're using our, our mean density here. And then there's a little bit of lava fill uh, at 2,650 um, inside. Without vertical exaggeration, you can see the uplift. We see the, there are mountain rings labeled here. The, Cordillera Rim, the Outer Rook, Inner Rook, um, and they correlate with faults that we now, using gravity, can actually see cut through the entire crust of the moon and uh, actually offset the crust, um, you know, crust mantle interface, which is, that was the first. It's been speculated that we might see that. We now definitely do. Here's, um, this is uh, actually not one of our best simulations yet. But this is a simulation. What happens when a big impact, this is oriental simulation. We get an oversteepened central peak. <coughs> the crust is folded back here. Uh, this is temperature. This is material. And an interesting thing is uh, the crust flows back in across to cover up the wound. We don't see naked mantle uh, of the moon anywhere. and. Um, if the moon is really cold, this doesn't happen. But if the moon is warmer, so we've now got a temperature measurement. If the moon's interior is warmer, <coughs> we get this horizontal flow of the crust back in to cover up the center. And our gravity model now is good enough to see that, yes, that is exactly what happened. So um, this gives us uh, some way of you know, estimating the temperature of the moon. Uh, we've done some more recent computations since. <coughs> the models have gotten better and better of the, this is the uplift. Uh, we now uh, can, in our computer simulation, put in localization so we can actually calculate the formation of faults and see that with the right, right properties, the right crustal thickness, the right temperature, and so on, we can reproduce uh, even the, the faults that we see in the basin. Here's an, another so but closer up uh, image of <coughs> what happens. This is vertically exaggerated, uh, which is why it looks a little bit weird. But you can see the ejecta, the, the extra crustal thickening out here, the mantle uplift. Uh, these lines were tracers that were originally horizontal. And you can see that the, the excavation of the crater really moves things around quite a bit. Basically, it, it takes the original crust and flops it upside down here. And then in, the crust moves inward. And covers up the, the, the wound. Now, it isn't just craters that we saw. We did see, uh, for example, we make a big deal of this. <coughs> Here's a dike. It's a, this is a gradient map of, uh, of the Bouguer gravity. We see a dike here. Uh, we think that, that and, and we can match it. You know, this is the gravity observed and a dike model. <coughs> so we, we think we can match it pretty well. This is, uh, we think, an intrusion of dense lava that at one stage, this is an ancient feature. We don't know how ancient, but certainly predates most of the craters on the far side. Um, it's a, uh, an uplift of dense lava 
underneath the surface of the moon. And this is an example in New Mexico. This is shiprock um, with some of the dikes. <coughs> this is what a dike looks like near a volcanic center. So there are some things that um, are um, not easily explained by just craters. But it sure, there aren't very many. There are no ore deposits on the moon. You know, I dis little disappointing if you're hoping to um, uh, colonize the moon. However, there are habitats. <coughs> there are places you can hide. You can get away from temperature variations, radiation, <coughs> meteorite impacts. This was first seen. This is a skylight about 130 meters in diameter, first ob observed by the uh, Selene Japanese mission to the moon. It's a hole in the surface of the moon. Well. One, one of the things I, I did with uh, some of our aerospace engineers at Purdue is I <coughs> set them to work to uh, look for gravity deficits on the moon's surface. Can we find any long linear gravity deficits we would correlate with caves? And indeed, here's this opening. And what we see is it is part of a bigger system of gravity deficits. We're, we're looking at an underneath the surface, a cave of some kind. And the gravity deficit is such that um, this is a big cave. In fact, what it fits <laughs> is something about three kilometers, four, three to four kilometers across, kilometer high. <coughs> Here's the skyline of Philadelphia <coughs> for scale. Um, it can't be any smaller than that. If, if it were filled with rubble, you wouldn't see the gravity signature that we do. It would have to be even bigger. Um, this is part of a, a paper. You know, actually, the, the student that led the paper grew up in Philadelphia, so which is why we put Philly in there. Um, is, a, is a hole in the surface of the moon that big stable? Uh, wouldn't it collapse? Uh, and the answer is yes, it's stable. This, this is part of a, a paper we published in 2000. 17, uh, the stresses are moderate, but um, we could uh, actually see this. In fact, <coughs> more recent um, reanalysis of some of the uh, Selene data, it had a radar sounder on it, and um, they, in fact, see radar returns that suggest uh, or that confirm um, that, uh, in fact, we're uh, not totally crazy. The, you know, gravity, gravity is not that diagnostic. You know, gravity sees through everything. And the problem is the gravity sees through everything. Uh, we don't know how deep they are from gravity. But we do now have um, radar measurements that say that's about uh, uh, 170 kilometers deep, Some 170 meters deep. Um, our long, this one was about uh, 40 kilometers long. We have one that's about 80 kilometers long and you know, four kilometers wide, kilometer high. <coughs> we could put all of uh, uh, you know uh, Greater Chicago City in in that lava tube. <coughs> so if we should ever decide to colonize the moon, <coughs> it's back to the caves, folks. Um, we've we've but we've got plenty of real estate underneath the surface in a, an area that you know those those roofs have held up for three billion years now, um, and um, you know it's, it's safe. It's a little dark. Um, we don't know what el what um, what resources might be inside these caves, perhaps volatiles, but uh, at any rate, uh, lava tubes are there, and they're big, so um, it's a potential for for habitation. Uh, the the average is about twenty minus twenty centigrade. Not not church sleeve, but it's not ridiculous. And <laughs> You know, the, on the surface of the moon at the equator, you know, go from, you know, plus 250 centigrade during the day to minus 290 or something like that at night. Um, and those, but those temperature variations don't go more than a meter deep. Hmm? <laughs> yeah, well, so we, <laughs> oh, anyway. Uh, what else? Um, the moon has a core. And it's liquid. <coughs> uh, <coughs> this is uh, these are moonquake locations. Uh, we think that the um, 
the core, well, we don't know. We, we, one of our, our areas that we looked at is, is there an inner core? We did not have a, you know, a secure detection of that. <clears throat> but the outer core is fluid between about 280 kilometers radius. How do we knew that, know that? Well, it's because uh, we can see how the moon flexes under tides. It, the distance between the moon and the Earth varies a little bit during the month. It's a slightly elliptical orbit. And um, as, the, uh, <coughs> as the tidal forces change, the moon flexes underneath that. We could see as, as the mission progressed, we have a, a time varying gravity field. We could see that tidal distortion of the moon. And the distortion is way too large for a solid core. So that tells us that the, um, the core is not only there, but it's also fluid. How, how you keep it fluid is, is a, an issue. It may be iron sulfide. That, that would be at temperatures that we, we would predict would have it fluid. It's not convecting at the present time. There's no lunar gravity field. But there is an ancient lunar gravity field. So at one time, it must have been convecting. <coughs> so results to date, um, the major results are, first of all, the lunar crust is highly fractured. Uh, gravity and topography of the moon are strongly correlated. Uh, all the imp ancient impact basins show up clearly as, the re you know, as circular gravity highs often surrounded by lows. Uh, the gravity signature is caused by impact crater collapse. We now, uh, for the first time as a result of this mission, think we have a viable model for how these mass cons form. Uh, there is no prosolarum impact basin. Uh, the uh, near side lava flames were fed by dikes at their edges. And um, <coughs> as an a extra bonus, with a high precision gravity field, we can now navigate safely at low altitudes around the moon. Um, I was also part of a, a proposal mission that would land on the far side and bring a sample back from the, uh, the South Lake Basin. We, we didn't get funded. But um, the, in the original proposal, we were going to spend almost, uh, <coughs> uh, well, $500 million to get the moon's gravity field so we could safely set down on the surface of the moon. Now we don't have to do that. <coughs> we have a, an adequate gravity field for almost any mission that you could imagine. And I have a proposal out for a radar mission to map these lava tubes in detail by flying low over the lunar surface. The, the, the Selene spacecraft had to orbit at 100 kilometers in order to avoid crashing. We can now uh, uh, navigate at 20 kilometers, and the radar return goes like the fourth power of distance. So <coughs> we can do a much better job with, uh, with radar and uh, really probe the surface. So I'll, I'll stop there and, and ask for questions. I've got a whole bunch of other backup slides, but um, maybe I'll answer some questions and bring up slides as appropriate.